I don't think we're out of the woods at all. I do think the first 24 hours after the Iranian retaliation were the most dangerous. We heard reports that actually Israel was about to launch a strike in response. But apparently after speaking to President Biden, Netanyahu decided to hold off. I'm Roland Oliphant, and this is Battle Lines. It's Friday, April 19th. Regardless of who stands with Israel, Israel will fight until this battle is won. I've made wartime decisions. I know the choices are never clear or easy for the leadership. I just find bombs and I find dead people, but it's a really scary thing for me. In this episode of Battle Lines, we speak to the Telegraph's Middle East correspondent, Natalia Vasilova, about how Israel will retaliate for Iran's April 14th missile strike. Then we speak to Holly Dagres, senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Source Middle East program and writer of the Iranist newsletter, about how Iran and Israel's relationship has developed from a shadow war to the brink of full-scale conflict. First, I spoke to Natalia about the atmosphere in Jerusalem following last week's enormous missile strike by Iran and the nervous anticipation of the retaliation. Natalia, it's very good to see you in person in the office, which gives us an opportunity to kind of catch up and get your sense of things. You just got back to London, I think, about a night and a half ago at the time of speaking. And I really want to come to, you know, discussion of the mood in Israel and what it's like and kind of anticipation, given what's going on. Can you just bring us up immediately, up to speed? What's the latest? Where are we right now, both with Gaza, but this standoff with Iran, which may or may not turn into a war? Hi, Roland, and hi, everyone. It's been a busy week in Israel. I think everyone was in waiting mode until now, waiting for the Israeli retaliation against the Iranian attack. At some point, it looked like it was imminent. We are now, what, four days after the Iranian attack. Nothing has happened. And the latest I've heard is apparently Israel is not going to retaliate until 10 days from now, because on Monday we have Pesach, also known as Passover one of the main holidays that that starts on Monday and lasts for the whole week. And imagine what a strain it would be on Israeli society if it was essentially on a war footing again, like all of the schools will have to be closed, all of the festivities would have to be cancelled, public services suspended. So there was this report this morning saying that Israelis are pretty much determined to retaliate, but they are not going to do it until after the 30th of April, which is the last day of Pesach. There was also an interesting report in a London-based newspaper called Al Arabi Al Jadid, which cited Egyptian sources saying that the US has actually agreed to an Israeli is actually agreed to sort of a, a deal, if I may put it this way, when Israel would launch a limited strike on Iran or Iranian interests in the region in exchange for very much scaled back military operation in Rafa. Again, that sounds quite strange because these are the two things that Israel has threatened to do. We heard for weeks that the West was opposed to the operation in Rafa. It looks like it's going to go ahead, but it looks like both of the events are going to be very much scaled back. Another thing I wanted to mention, which I don't think got enough coverage this morning, is renewed attacks on the north of Israel by Hezbollah from Lebanon. There was one attack last night in which 14 IDF reservists and four civilians were wounded in an attack on a community center in a village actually further out from the border than where attacks normally happen. The building was initially struck by two anti-tank missiles and then was hit by an Iranian-made drone. And there are interesting reports in Israeli newspapers this morning describing the, the type of the drone, showing how advanced and sophisticated it is compared to what we have seen in the past. Apparently, it is capable of providing um, a real-time video feed to the operator and can carry a payload of more than 40 um, kilos of explosives. I think this one is very important because it's basically a window into what hostilities could look like on the Israeli border in the north if Hezbollah were to actually join the war and go in full force, as it has not done in the past. Mm. Let, let's unpack that a second, just for the context for our listeners. If I if I may be so bold, I'm beginning to see a bit of a pattern there. So April 1st, you have the Israeli strike on the Iranian consulate in Damascus. You get the Iranian response on the 14th of April, two weeks later, 
with this massive rocket and drone strike against Israel. And now you're, we're, we're saying that after Pesach, April 30th, that's when we can imagine the response. So it's kind of two week gaps between things, which I suppose might give an outside observer a degree of reassurance that we are still in the kind of semi-regulated shadow war that still has rules because the the fear of this moment is that, okay, maybe we're in the moment where the shadow war is now an overt war where the tit for tat unspoken rules are abandoned and eventually, you just talked about Hezbollah, eventually Iran finally presses that Hezbollah button, which they've kept in reserve for so many years to launch an all-out strike on Israel and then all bets are off full-scale war. Do you think, given everything you've just said, um, and the Israelis agreeing to a more limited strike under American pressure, that are we out of the woods? Are we, are we kind of the, the chances of this blowing up into a, into a full-scale regional war are now diminishing? I don't think we're out of the woods at all. I do think the first 24 hours after the retali- Iranian retaliation were the most dangerous. And we we heard reports that actually Israel was about to launch a strike in response that night and the morning on Sunday. But apparently after speaking to President Biden, Netanyahu made his mind and decided to hold off. So I definitely think that, you know, we can be reassured in a lot of sense that that whatever response comes next, it's not going to be as hot headed as it would have been in the first 48 hours. We have seen we have heard from Iran that to them, the retaliation was a one-off and they made it clear that, you know, we're just going to do it. We're going to stop at that. We will get our revenge as they saw it and we're going to stop. Um, but Ap- that- Appreciate our restraint is what they said. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, exactly. The expectation was everyone is going to call it quits and go home. Israel doesn't want to go home, so to speak. And we're not out of the woods yet because we don't know how they will strike, what they will strike. Even if they strike outside of Iranian territory. It could be something as sensitive as the general as they killed in Damascus. And it could provoke another wave of retaliation strike. Or, you know, it could take another form. It could take another form of Hezbollah attack in the north. And, you know, we can talk about the apocalyptic scenarios of Hezbollah taking out power stations in the north, which would be far more um, damaging and dangerous than sending drones from Iran, which takes nine hours to, 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 to reach Israel. Mm. So, so could you unpack for us very, very quickly, like w- what do you think the options are that the Israelis are looking at? If we escalate from kind of the lowest level to the to the highest kind of mm. most hot-headed thing you can do, we obviously don't know what they're going to do, but could you just kind of lay out the menu? Yeah. I think in all of the all-out war that we have seen, we forgot about more sophisticated met- methods that uh, Israel has in its arsenal and that it uses. I was recently looking back at the history of the shadow war between Iran and Israel, and I came across stunning things that I was not aware of. Like there was apparently a concerted campaign by Israel to literally kill Iranian scientists and something like five Iranian scientists were assassinated or died in mysterious circumstances in the space of two years. There was a massive malware attack on Iranian nuclear facilities. Yeah, something like 2012. So options start from there. It it can be something sort of very invasive. It can be a massive cyber attack targeting nuclear facilities, targeting the power grid or transportation. It can be assassinations on the Iranian soil. There was some talk in Israeli media about Mossad network in Iran and how you know it can activate its network if it wanted to. That's that's us moving from sort of the lower end of the spectrum. Spectrum. Then we can see Israel hitting Iranian interests in Lebanon and Syria, which could mean generals and functionaries like like the general who was killed on the first of April. They could be targeting Iranian training camps in in in, in Lebanon. They could be train targeting uh, weapons depots of so different interests and. Um, next step could be attacking um, Iranian soil as such. They could target nuclear facilities. There's a big question mark on how effective that that could be. They could target oil facilities, which would be very painful for the um, Iranian economy. And it's obviously it's a question of how much the United States would like to see that, because obviously that would um, lead to a massive increase in um, uh, would cause volatility on the energy markets. And yeah, I mean, like, that obviously, there are so many targets that, that Israel has the capacity of reaching. There's not a huge amount of anxiety or panic in society about the prospect of the great big 
enormous war that may or may not happen will the huge i mean they talk about hezbollah having 150,000 rockets if they ever go off you know it is the nightmare scenario mm. doesn't sound from what you're saying like th there's a huge amount of panic or anxiety about the prospect of that being closer not at all and my one of the things how i judge it by is property markets and i was recently talking to an in an agent about people moving in moving out property prices in israel are as high as as they've ever been no one is ditching their apartments and like trying to find someone to rent it out for a hundred dollars a month. It doesn't look like people are packing and leaving. Actually, after October the 7th, there was a wave of people leaving the country. A lot of them would be well-off Israelis who just wanted to sit it out for a couple of weeks. They came and went. I know of people who were recent immigrants, for example, coming from Russia, they, they would move their in 2022, spend there for like they would be there like for a year and a half. They would see how it is. They would see that it doesn't work for them. They would move, move on somewhere else. But there hasn't been a major exodus. It wasn't like you know we need to think about our future. Let's move to another country. I haven't seen that. You mentioned this this apparent deal between the United States and Israel, which sounds like, if it is as reported, that the Americans have finally consented to allow these you know okay go into Rafa. And the Israeli quid pro quo is, okay, we won't do a very big strike on Iran. This is quite significant because, of course, Rafah is that last place in, in, in southern Gaza where I think it's about a million and a half refugees packed in, mm -hmm. really serious humanitarian situation. The Israelis have been saying there's still, the guy I spoke to last week said four Hamas brigades still there. We can't finish the job unless we go in. We have to go in. The United States, Britain... Israel's allies, humanitarian organizations are all saying this is going to be a humanitarian disaster. Now it looks like it's going to happen. Can you walk us through that, bring us up to date on what's happening in Gaza? We've been a bit distracted by Iran. And what is the significance of that decision? Yeah, I think it's quite extraordinary because in the past weeks, it, it looked like it was increasingly unlikely that Israel would go and do it at all. We saw mounting international pressure against doing it, especially in light of recurring reports of famine and malnutrition in Gaza. And it's it's funny how the tables have turned now and whatever public support in the West Israel has lost in recent months, it looks like it recouped some by that attack because it's allowed Israelis to, to, to show to the world, look at us, we're being attacked. We are the ones that are getting lobbed with cruise missiles and ballistic missiles that, that night. And yeah, actually one of the reasons why Israel is not going berserk, as one politician suggested, against Iran is the fact that it has unfinished business in Gaza and it, it feels like it, it needs to do that. So yeah, also this is happening this is almost, what, seven months in this war? It looks like a lot of Israeli troops have pulled out from, they've pulled out from the north, they've pulled out from the center of Gaza. And previously, when international aid organizations were saying that you cannot organize an evacuation because those people have nowhere to go, it looks like there might be a chance to actually evacuate those people somewhere. Going back into northern parts of Gaza. But back in the northern parts of Gaza, I think last week, there was a rumor basically on the ground and we saw hundreds of people moving to the north on their own because they heard that it was safe to go. They would turn back. There were even some shots fired. I think several people were killed. But obviously it showed that people felt that it was safe enough to go back and it was obviously better to be at home, whatever is left from their homes. The latest I've seen this morning was that apparently Israel came up with a plan where it's going to divide Rafa into bubbles, which is the term that it used, and that they're going to sort of pluck and evacuate people from all of those bubbles and like segments of Rafa and pinpointedly attack each of them. I have no idea how you can do it because this area is really, really so small and cramped. But uh, yeah, that's the plan. And what's just just what's the latest we know about the the humanitarian situation in Gaza? I mean, it's been dire for a long time. Aid agencies are still talking about difficulties distributing aid. Could just give us a picture of uh, of the situation at the moment. Yeah, it's it's still dire, but we got some positive news. I think last week when in northern the first opening in the north was closed, which allowed to for aid trucks to get in directly from 
from Israel into, into the north of Gaza. I've also seen pictures of the first bakery reopening in Gaza. And I think it was the UN food program was going to open another one. And like, it sounds very trivial, like a bakery being reopened, but it's actually a big, de- big deal in an area where like there's absolutely nothing. And what's more importantly, we haven't seen that massive amount of fighting and uh, airstrikes on Gaza as in previous weeks, which obviously allows for some sort of if not reconstruction, but sort of repair works to repair water pipes and rebuild those and op- reopen those bakeries. So it looks like there is a window right now to try and bring some life back into the north of Israel, into the center of Israel, to possibly allow residents to go back. Do you think the a couple of weeks ago, the horrendous strike on the world central kitchen workers, which caused a massive backlash amongst Israel's allies, you had you know Biden basically saying, look, this is it, I am going to pull the plug unless you change the way you're doing things. Can you attribute that to that? Have we actually seen a a change in the way the IDF operates there since then? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's good that you mentioned it because, yeah, we completely forgot about it. It definitely went went off the agenda with the Iranian attack. And all of those steps that I'm talking about, including the opening of the northern of the northern crossing into Gaza, including Israel is allowing uh, the Ashdod port to take in the, the cargo. This is all that happened in a matter of days after the attack. And this is something that the international community has been clamoring for for weeks. And Israel said that either it didn't have the capacity to do it or it wasn't the right moment to do it. But it definitely showed that it's possible. It can be done. I think there is the world kitchen attack. That's that's one point of pressure. Another one is, you know, we, we shouldn't forget that the South African lawsuit against Israel in the International Criminal Court is still very much there. The court has been asking Israel to submit reports on what it's doing to alleviate the human suffering. So that that's another point of pressure. And it looks like it's somewhat working. I wouldn't say it, it's, it's working 100%, but, you know, we're definitely seeing some progress. And do you think that w- what was kind of interesting about the, the, the April 14th, Iranian rocket attack Mm -hmm. on Israel was how many allies came to Israel's defense, the United States, the kingdom, the Arab kingdoms, Jordan, Saudi Arabia. Do you think that has maybe served to remind certain elements in the Israeli establishment that they are dependent on their allies and and that therefore the allies get a get a voice in how they conduct operations? Absolutely. And I think that the IDF would know better than anyone how much all of those allies helped to ward off this attack with so many different things with phys- physically sending jets to um, shoot off shoot down those missiles to like Germany providing refuel, refuel refueling stations in Jordan it's it sounds like a small thing but like it looks like it was a very complicated operation with so many people involved so many nations involved and um, I think to this day we I haven't heard a full list of who did what like how many rockets did the UK shoot down? And obviously, the IDF has those figures, and he and they see the impact of that help. So I think it was a, a very welcome reminder of how dependent they are, and whatever they want to do, you know, they they cannot expect everyone to stop and drop what they're doing, like they did with the Iranian attack, unless they're meeting someone halfway and doing and making some sort of compromises. Mm-hmm. Um, Natalia, thank you very much. Um, for joining us. I wish you a nice break um, out of the firing line um, before you return to report from probably, um, well, probably the anticipated Israeli strike on Iran. Thank you very much for joining us. That was the view from Jerusalem. But what do things look like from Tehran? I'm joined by Holly Dagres, to talk about how the scale of the Islamic Republic's attack on Israel took many observers by surprise. Holly, take us back to the beginning. Right? Where does this incredible antagonism between Israel and Iran come from? Well, I would say that it's part of the Islamic Republic's doctrine. It's one of the top things is that they would like Israel to be replaced with Palestine. And so this has been embedded in the Islamic Republic since the 1979 revolution. That's why you see at the last Friday of every Ramadan, 
a Quds day or a Jerusalem day and to show solidarity with the Palestinians. And so this has been deeply embedded in the system for the past four decades. And it's also found not just in the rhetoric of high-ranking Iranian officials such as Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, but it's on state media, it's in school books, it's in the papers, it's in billboards. But I, I think I should note that just because this is the rhetoric coming from the clerical establishment doesn't mean the average Iranian feels the same way about Israel and the conflict. Could you give us a sense of how we've got to this point where it seems like this decades-long shadow war, if you will, which has been managed for a very long time, seems to be um, bursting out into the open. Do we think this is a, a something that was planned by uh, Ayatollah Khamenei um, and the people around him, or have they kind of been dragged by events um, into a level of confrontation they perhaps weren't planning? Well, Roland, this retaliation by Iran on April 13th, 14th, depending on the time zone, um, was in response to the April 1st Israeli airstrike on the Iranian embassy compound in Damascus, Syria, that killed top commanders of the IRGC's external force, the Quds Force. And Iran um, called it a violation of um, its its soil, like its land. And this was the response. Now, the response was, I think, a complete um, shock to, I'd say, most analysts. I think that there was a sense that Iran wouldn't retaliate directly. Um, I certainly was one of those people that didn't think that that was how it was going to play out. And it was just jaw-dropping seeing the footage of fire in the sky above Jerusalem's Dome of the Rock, which um, is considered one of the three most holiest sites in Islam. And so this direct retaliation has brought Iran and Israel out of their decade-long shadow war and out into the open. And it's something that cannot be reversed. Just walk us through why you were so shocked about the the scale of the response. what, 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 what is so strange about that? Well, I think for starters, the fact that it was direct. Um, there was this notion that it would be maybe somewhere in the Golan Heights or um, it would be used, proxies would be only um, um, involved in this, that maybe they would uh, um, bomb a Israeli embassy somewhere, maybe somewhere like... Um, obscure um, in Africa or somewhere, not like in a big European city, for instance. Um, So I I think that the fact that they went so directly and to have fired as much as they had um, over 300 munitions, drones, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles directly was what really caught us off guard. But at the same time, they also gave a 72-hour warning reportedly. They gave a heads up that this is what they were going to do. So in some ways, they wanted them not to hit anything. And 99% of those projectiles were taken out um, with the exception of some ballistic missiles. And it seemed that the an air base in southern Israel that houses the country's um, most sophisticated fighter jets, the F-35s, are, were located at this base. And um, no one was killed, thankfully, but a seven-year-old Bedouin girl remains in critical condition. So, I mean, thankfully, this um, response by the United States, Israel, Jordan, France, and the intelligence provided by the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia was able to respond and make sure this doesn't um, escalate beyond um, the damage it had caused. But now we understand that Israel wants to respond and will respond. It's just a matter of when and how. Hmm. So it seems to me that there's this there's this dichotomy here that that you've kind of drawn out in what you just said, which is between this. Um, so Hamanei, the supreme leader, is always meant to have been renowned for his kind of strategic patience. That's the thing that you know they've always talked about. Um, 
And and this strike seems it seems to combine two things. One seems to be the strategic patience doctrine. Okay, we signaled it in advance. Um, you were you were meant to intercept it because we didn't actually want to escalate it to the level of an all out war. Um, the other interpretation is um, no, this was massive. Iran really meant to do Israel really really serious damage, but was thwarted. Um, could you? What's your best guess here? Like, what what was the reasoning? Um, and does this mean that, you know, Hamanei and the people around him are, um, I think one of them said that the era of strategic deterrence is over. Um, have they decided they uh, they want the big fight with Israel that they've been building up to you for so long? Um, there's a lot to unpack there. I think the one thing I left out too that I really was interesting was in the middle of this barrage, as it was going on, the Iranian permanent mission to the United Nations had tweeted out, in essence, that this was done, that they cited Article 51 of the United Nations Charter about defense. And we're like, this is all we're going to do. And it's going to be done after we fire these things. And that to me signaled that they thought this was a proportionate response to what had happened. Like in their eyes, the Iranian embassy compound, the building that it housed that was um, taken out in this airstrike um, was Iranian soil. And so they thought the equivalent would be to hit Israeli soil, which to me, again, going back to what I said earlier, was very shocking that they went all in and went directly for the country of Israel itself. Um, the So I don't think that despite we've for 45 years, we've heard them chant death to Israel. They've basically said that they want to, not basically, they've said that they want to wipe Israel off the map. They've made numerous threats, whether it's high-ranking Iranian officials, billboards in Tehran, that all um, have rhetoric around the same lines. But here they had the opportunity to do it, and they didn't give Israel all its might. Um, I think it's noteworthy that, yes, there were proxies also involved on April 13th, 14th. You had Yemen, Syria and Iraq also fire projectiles, but Hezbollah and Lebanon didn't. They fired maybe a handful, but it wasn't related, and it was before the events had transpired. So to me, Tehran wasn't giving all its might, and um, it, it seems that this was a message. Um, I think it wasn't the right message because it's now open a box that can't be closed, and. I think there's a, it was a real miscalculation on Iran's part, but in some ways, it's also done it some favors with the Arab streets, who um, have actually been vehemently anti-Israel since the Gaza war broke out in October 2023. Mm. Um, so we've been speaking, I've, well, but the, a fixer of ours has managed to speak to a couple of IRGC men, um, low-level guys, right? People doing their conscription, um, you know, kind of standing on checkpoints somewhere in 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 rural around. I think one of them serving, um, you know, somewhere out near the Pakistani border, which is a fairly you know volatile area in its own right. Um, and 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 these guys we spoke to were pretty annoyed, is is the way I'd put it. You know, the sentiments. Now I'm paraphrasing here. Um, were things like, what are they doing? What well, now? We're going to have a fight with Israel. Um, I was going to propose to my girlfriend. Um, this is like, I'm actually genuinely scared. Um, and and what one of them said, look, all I want to do is finish my service, get out, and then move to Canada where my aunt lives, or something like that. Um, could you could you talk to us a little bit about the? IRGC and its role in um, in Iranian society, because we often hear about it being a, a massive um, monolith. But these conversations suggest actually there's a there's a lot more nuance in that organization. Well, the conscripts you're speaking of um, in Iran, men have to serve two years mandatory conscription. Um, there were some rules and regulations at some point where you could buy out your conscription, but that was more for elite families to do. So the average Iranian couldn't afford it. So um, the individuals you were speaking of, or the one individual you're speaking of, I mean, I wouldn't say they represent 
like the upper echelons of the IRGC, the the world famous, notorious Quds Force Commander Ghassan Soleimani, for instance, who was assassinated by a U.S. drone strike in 2020 while he was visiting Baghdad, Iraq. Like, uh, not everybody thinks and acts the same way within the IRGC. And I think just that example you gave is uh, really exemplifies that. Having that been said, um, so the concept of the IRGC itself, its role was to protect, protect the Islamic Republic from inside and outside threats. Outside through the Glitz Force, its external arm. Inside through groups like the Basij People's Militia, which um, have cracked down on people during mass protests like the Women Life Freedom Uprising. And They've actually grown so much, I would say, in the past two decades. Um, They've got their hands in much of the Iranian economy. They also are involved in arts and culture. Um, Iran's version of the Apple series Tehran, Gando, which is like a spy thriller, is actually IRGC produced. And it's their version of like how the IRGC is saving Iran from outside threats like Israel and the United States. And so they've really put, gotten involved in all aspects of Iran. And um, I think one thing that's really noteworthy that I was reading yesterday on social media was that the Iranian foreign ministry didn't summon the Swiss ambassador to Tehran, which is also the representative of the United States' interest in the country. It was the IRGC. And I think that was really noteworthy and it really showed this divide within the Iranian government that um, the foreign ministry no longer had the power it used to. And we actually saw this when uh, a few years ago, this audio link of then foreign minister Mohammad Javad Zarif had came out and he was talking about how um, the IRGC um, had this increasing role in Iranian foreign affairs. Mm. So it's a sprawling organization. It's military. It's also got a massive grip on the economy. It's operating in arts and culture. Um, it's running foreign policy. Um, and it's also running the kind of overseas operations in um, across the Middle East. Um, and I raise this because one of the things that Israel is asking its neighbors, its allies to do, um, and something that a lot of Iranian dissidents um, and, and exiles are, are, are lobbying for, um, and some conservative British politicians is to list the IRGC as a terrorist group, um, that most Western governments are kind of resisting this. Um, could you unpack those, the dilemmas around that? Well, the United States under the Donald Trump administration designated the IRGC as a foreign terrorist organization in 2019. Um, the European Union and the United Kingdom have not, um, as you rightfully noted, there are um, individuals in the West from government to dissidents that are calling for that. But I think it's also noteworthy that Iranians in city Iran have also called for the designation of the IRGC. Um, we've seen like in during protests, like in Sistan and Baluchistan province, them actually hold English signs that say hashtag designate IRGC because they're so desperate for um, the West to put some sort of pressure on the Islamic Republic so that, in a sense, there could be change in the country. And so um, this has been an increasing increasing call um, from inside Iran and outside. So some of the complications, I think, um, at least I, I can't speak for the Europeans, but from my conversation with European diplomats is that um, uh, I ha- designating the IRGC, for example, in the case of the UK, would mean that it would threaten it, their presence in Tehran. So there is a British embassy, and there's this concern that if they were to designate, that they would get kicked out of the country and there would no longer be eyes on the ground, despite the fact that the British embassy notoriously is known for having limits on its ability to move throughout the country anyways. So... Um, I think there's some concern there and there's some concern that um, if 
somehow the JCPOA or the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the nuclear deal was revived in some shape or form. Designating the IRGC would be trade would be practically impossible because, as I said earlier, they have their hands on all aspects of the Iranian economy. And so let's say you want to do business on oil or cement or something, anything, mining, and very likely that organization would have ties to the IRGC and that means that wouldn't be possible. So there's that element as well. Is it also true that you face the possibility of basically uh, criminalizing large numbers of people who are not necessarily, as you say, you know, the Qasem Soleimani's of this world, um, but kind of ordinary Iranians and therefore driving them um, perhaps into the arms of the regime when the long-term goal of, of many Western governments might be to let me, let me, actually, let, let, me, let, me, let me phrase this another way. Um, so the IRGC is big. It's sprawling. It's got many heads. It does many different things. Um, one of the arguments I've heard is that, look, if there comes a moment when the Islamic Republic is about to crumble and the current regime might crumble, action or inaction by factions within the IRGC could make the difference um, in whether the regime survives or not. Um, Therefore, someone has suggested to me, um, designating the entire organization as a terrorist organization would be counterproductive because actually you want to foster divisions, you want to court people within the organization. In your view, is that, is that a reasonable kind of assessment um, or do you think that's naive? Uh, no, you haven't lost me. I'm moving because the dog has decided he wants to weigh in on this conversation and give as many opinions. Um, okay, I just moved to my bedroom. My apologies. Um, okay. So one of, I think one of the things that has been underreported in the media is that there are over a hundred families in the United States that are actually impacted by this designated designation, excuse me. Um, and these families are unable to see their loved ones because a husband, for example, served as a conscript or a son has served as a conscript. And so it's actually divided families. I know, for example, of a couple that got married in Iran, but the husband can't come to the United States because of his conscription. And so this has been some of the ramifications of that designation. Yes, those numbers are small, but they do exist. Um, if there was a fall of the regime tomorrow, this would complicate matters for sure. But I think that this is where there needs to be improvements on the designation itself. For example, in the United States, um, there should be like an addition to this designation that maybe exempts conscripts maybe, for example, ones that had served prior to 2019 or, or um, are able to prove that they were serving as a conscript doing mundane tasks. Um, similarly, um, there's been this push from the diaspora that, well, there's this realization that if the regime was to fall tomorrow, there, you can't have a debathification in Iran, you, like a de-IRGC um, removal or anything along those lines. You're going to have to accept that these guys need to be part of the new system. And so they, they've been um, talking about including them in a future of Iran. Now, these are all hypotheticals, of course, but maybe an off-ramp of some sort that would give that opportunity could be possible. Again, these are hypotheticals, but this is along the lines of what some people have been thinking. I was last in Iran in 2021 to report the last presidential election, which was won by Ibrahim Raisi. And I mean, it's, it's, all, it's always a, a fascinating, deeply fascinating place to go, but was really noticeable then, um, even with a limited amount of reporting I could do around, around Tehran, um, was a deep sense of, of disillusionment. I mean, kind of 
turnout was down, you know, polling stations had kind of run out of people by um, late in the afternoon. A lot of people said they weren't going to vote. Um, there was a, a a deep sense of despondency that it was difficult to ignore. Um, and a lot of people talked about, and a lot of observers have talked about, a general fatigue with the Islamic Republic itself. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about that kind of where where is um, Iranian society as as best we know? I would say that the Women Life Freedom Uprising, which was prompted by the murder of Masajina and Wini by by the so-called morality police, really brought to head this realization across the board that the Islamic Republic is irredeemable. It was a notion that many Iranians have been feeling for the past few years, but I think that was a real moment where Iranians were like, I'm willing to die. I'm willing to go out on the streets and face bullets and batons to oust this regime. And it was evident not just by their actions, but their words. They were chanting things like freedom, 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 azadi, 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 and saying that the Supreme Leader was a murderer and that the and that they wanted to sacrifice their lives for Iran. And so this sentiment really started in December 2017, January 2018 onwards. I note that because that was the first mass protest we saw that was the largest in terms of geography since the 1979 revolution. And we've had big protests since, including November 2019, in which security forces killed 1500 people under the guise of an internet shutdown and of course the women life freedom uprising being the most recent and all these smaller ones in between and so iranians are fed up with the status quo they don't like the islamic republic um it does still have a support base as evident by the elections the presidential elections that you um visited iran for had the lowest pres- election turnout in its history for a presidential election. I think that about 16 or 17 million voted for President Ibrahim Raisi to take office. And I would say that's probably the number of supporters the Islamic Republic has um, out of some 85 million people. So, But that's still enough to keep them in power for the time being and to appeal to that small support base. I think there's a, to quote journalist Robin Wright, there's a 30% rule. Like if you have 30% support as an authoritarian government, you can survive. So I would say it's around something around there because they've managed to survive for as long as they have. What's the root of the disillusionment? Is it the economy? Is it being isolated? Is it the the suppression the the crackdowns on women what 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 is driving that well it's an array of things and all of the above i would say it's systemic mismanagement corruption repression um iranians want to live ordinary lives um they have the same needs and wants as me and the united states and you in the uk they want to live and they're not able to do so under the restrictions of the Islamic Republic and the isolation that it's caused. Um, and so thanks to satellite dishes, the internet and social media, Iranians see how the rest of the world works and lives and they want a piece of that. And rightfully so. You could argue that the, the big legitimizing achievement of the Islamic Republic was seeing off Saddam Hussein's invasion in the 1980s. Um, that's what solidified the revolution. That's what, you know, kind of the whole country had to rally. If Israel was to launch a major attack on Iran, the question is, does the Iranian public say that is the last straw? These guys have got us into a ridiculous war that's not in our interest. Let's get rid of them. Or do they rally to the flag? Do they say, the country is under attack and we're going to defend it. 
That's a really loaded question. I feel like I could have answered it with more confidence maybe a decade ago, but when there was still hope in the country. But things are so dire that it's really hard to say. And it really, I think, also depends on how Israel does respond. If Israel does something that hurts the civilian population, I think you will definitely see Iranians rally around the flag and be very upset by that. But I think if you see them attack um, nuclear and defense facilities, I think the reaction might be a mixed bag. Um, on the one hand, I think it's a, they'll say it's a violation of Iranian soil and worry about the, the response and retaliation by the Islamic Republic in the aftermath. But um, Iranians are, some Iranians are just so desperate for change that they're, they, they potentially would accept some uh, retaliation on nuclear and de- defense facilities. But again, Iran's a country of over 85 million. And just like in the United States and the United Kingdom, they have a wide array of views. I would say that overall, no Iranian wants war. Um, They've lived through the bloody Iran-Iraq war that lasted for eight years. And that's why they, the moment that these events transpired, they were lining up at gas stations, kilometer long lines for gas and going to convenience stores that might have been open at 1, 2 a.m. local time to buy little that they can because they were nervous about the retaliation by Israel. So it, it's really hard to say, but Iranians, I think this to put it simply, many Iranians don't like this regime, would like it to be gone, but if it leads to a all-out war, I don't think that they would want to see something like that. Do you think the memory of the Iran-Iraq war, which still absolutely permeates Iranian society, right? you just have to like, kind of walk around Tehran and there's paintings of martyrs, everyone remembers things. I remember war, I was you know, just going from a polling station to a polling station when I was reporting the election. And you know, the guy I was with was like, oh, I nearly got hit by a rocket there. I remember that. Um, you know, when the Iraqis were firing missiles at Tehran, it still completely permeates um, the memory. Do you think the memory of that informs the the relative reluctance of the Iranian regime to bring this um, this long term shadow war with Israel to a head? You know, they've never actually, as you say, fully acted on their words. Um, they keep Hezbollah in reserve as a kind of the powder is dry um, to use if necessary. Um, do you think that that informs a certain caution? And is there a danger that maybe as, as a younger generation of, um, of hardliners come in that that, um, that caution fades, that, that the generational memory of, of just how bad it was leads to people being a little bit more reckless about the prospect of getting embroiled? in something like that again? Well, I certainly would say the Iran-Iraq war had a major impact on a whole generation of Iranians that were in the upper echelons of the clerical establishment, including Qasem Soleimani himself. Soleimani, had it not been for the Iran-Iraq war, would have been running a karate dojo in Karawan. That's a true story. And so their, their worldview in foreign policy doctrine is based off that war where they felt they were not protected by international norms, Saddam Hussein's chemical weapons, for instance, or the Scud missiles he was firing on Iranian cities. And that's in part, for instance, why they have a ballistic missiles program. It's because they realize that they have air inferiority they have these dated Shaw era Tom cats. And so what they were able to do was have the most diverse and long range missile system in the region, despite international isolation and sanctions. And I think just talking about the events that transpired on April 13th, 14th is that, you know, 
this showed that they no longer have air inferiority. Yes, 99% of their projectiles were taken out, but they still managed to fire them from directly from Iranian to Israeli soil. So I think that in some self was a feat for the Iranians. But talking about the Iran-Iraq war and forming the thinking of the hard, the new generation of hardliners, um, I, I think that as the memory of the Iran-Iraq war fades, um, it, it's going to be harder to convince individuals of what the worries and dangers of war are. But my understanding of the the new generation of hardliners is that they still were of age when those events transpired. So I think it'll still be in the back of their mind. But does that mean that that'll prevent an all-out war with Israel? I really can't say because the fact that they directly decided to attack Israel in itself was a risk that could lead to an all-out war. And maybe the war games that they had practiced had calculated a scenario where cooler heads would prevail, but especially since they had given a warning prior and all of that. But, you know, there's always room for miscalculation. And I find it reckless that the Islamic Republic would attack a nuclear armed state, not once, but just twice. Um, just in, earlier this year, they had also retaliated against Pakistan after Pakistan had fired on um, separatist militants in Sistan and Baluchistan province, um, terrorist groups. And so I think we're looking at a different dynamic, and I think this is led by the IRGC. And it doesn't mean it's going to bode well for the Islamic Republic in the future if these are the kind of calculations they want to make. And maybe they're making them because they feel that they can lean on Russia and China, who are two permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. But it's really hard to say. Mm. Um, Holly, thank you very much. That's all for Battle Lines this time. Please join us again next week for more of The Telegraph's best foreign reporting. Goodbye. Battle Lines is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our news, analysis and dispatches from around the world, subscribe to The Telegraph or sign up to Dispatches, which brings stories from our award-winning correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a live blog on our website where you can follow updates on Israel and Gaza as they come in throughout the day, including insight from contributors to this podcast. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Battle Lines on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it really helps others find the show. As disinformation is a particular problem during conflict, we are relying on your support more than ever. Battle Lines is part of wider Telegraph foreign coverage in our podcasts. If you're interested in finding out more about the war in Ukraine, you can listen to our sister podcast, Ukraine the Latest. Battle Lines is produced by David Dagahi and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.